I'm gonna show you how to get started with Firebase for the web. Now, you might be using one of many different environments or platforms. You might use Angular, React, Vue, Svelte, or even plain JavaScript. No matter what you're using, I'm gonna teach you the fundamentals of including Firebase in your web apps. Now, there are so many different ways of including Firebase into your web app, but in this video, we're gonna use two key tools, and that's NPM and a module bundler. Now, if you don't have NPM installed, don't worry, check the link in the show notes and you can install Node.js, which automatically includes NPM. But we're gonna get started in four steps. Step one, installing Firebase. I'm in my editor, Visual Studio Code, and I have my project open. I'm gonna use the terminal within VS Code to run the command npm init-y to set up my npm package, which, by the way, make sure to go back and fill out all these fields in your package.json with real information. Then I'm gonna install the Firebase SDK with npm i Firebase. Once the command finishes, you have access to the Firebase library. And this brings us to step two, creating a Firebase app. I'm gonna create a folder named SRC and a file named index.js. Then I'm gonna write an import statement that references the Firebase slash app sub package. From there, I'll import the initialize app function. This function creates a Firebase app that stores your Firebase configuration for your project. When you create a Firebase project in the Firebase console, we give you a configuration object that you pass to this function. And this function returns a Firebase app instance. This instance is how the Firebase SDK knows how to connect to your specific Firebase backend. Now, I know what you're thinking. What about this configuration object? Isn't it unsafe to include this kind of information on the client? Can't someone take this info and delete all my data in my database or something bad like that? The Firebase configuration object is perfectly safe to include on the client side. It's how the Firebase library knows how to talk to your Firebase project. If you're worried about security, which you should be, so that's good, you secure your Firebase projects by using security rules and app check. If you want to learn more about those, then check the links in the description. But we're going to move on to step three, which is importing Firebase services. Let's say I want to monitor authentication state. So I'll import Firebase auth. Now, you might not be using Firebase auth, but don't worry because it doesn't matter what I'm using in this video. Each Firebase service follows a similar pattern. You import the service from its path, Firebase slash service, then import the service getter function. In this case, it's get auth. And as you would expect, each sub package has a getter function. If I was also using Firestore, then I would follow a similar pattern. What's important to note here is that you must initialize your Firebase app first before calling any service getter function. Each getter function can optionally take in the Firebase app as a parameter which I prefer to pass in just to be explicit. Now to use a feature like monitoring authentication state, you import those as individual functions. These individual functions take the Firebase service as the first parameter. The onauth state changed function then also takes a callback that tells me if a user is logged in. This is the pattern that the Firebase SDK follows for each sub package as well. Each function takes in an argument of either the service returned from the getter function or some relevant container object, like in Firestore. If I want to create a collection, I'll need to pass in the Firestore service as the first parameter. If I want to get the documents in this collection, I can import the getDocs function and then pass the collection as the first parameter. Now. You might be wondering why these features are imported as individual functions that take in a service as the first parameter. You might think that these functions would be methods available on the service itself. We actually had our older library structured that way, but we learned over time that your web app can get significant performance improvements by following this functional approach. Why? 
because when library code is structured in this functional way, JavaScript module bundlers know how to eliminate unused code, and this is known as tree shaking. It's extremely useful for reducing the amount of library code in your application, which in turn will help speed up page load performance. Now, we can't run this code as is in the browser because the browser doesn't understand these imports. Now, you might have seen in the documentation something called browser modules. Browser modules are a native web platform feature that allow you to export and import code as modules. I'm gonna take these NPM paths and convert them over to browser module paths. And these are just what looks like links out to a JavaScript file. And what's great about these are is that you can run these automatically in the browser. So I'll add a index.html file and do a simple little boilerplate. And then in my head, I will reference the script. And the important thing with browser modules is to include the attribute type equals module. And now I'm just going to serve this directory. And then here in the browser, we can see that it says no user. And when I click in, we, this is the exact code that we have in our editor. We provide examples for using browser modules because it's really easy to get started. You just copy the code, paste it in into the browser, and it just works. But we don't recommend using them for production. For production, we recommend module bundlers like Webpack and Rollup. And that's because there are so many optimizations that they can do, just like tree shaking, which will eliminate any unused code from the Firebase library. Now, keep in mind, if you're using a framework CLI tool like Angular CLI, Create React App, Vue CLI, Next.js, SvelteKit, these tools, they handle the module bundling for you. They'll use a tool like Webpack or Rollup underneath the hood. So all the code that we've written so far will just automatically get bundled for you in those tools. But if you're doing this by hand or you just want to learn how it works with Webpack, then tune in to the last step. Let's revert back to the npm import path and then install Webpack from npm, but with two packages, Webpack and Webpack CLI. And we'll do the dash capital D flag to save it as a development dependency. And to use this, we'll tap into our no modules folder, then dot bin. And then from here, we can use the Webpack command. The way that module bundlers work is that they look for a file called an entry point. This is the root of your JavaScript code, and it usually imports everything needed for the application. And then dash O for an output folder of dist. But pro tip, if your entry point is located at src index.js and your output file needs to be dist slash main.js, then you can drop all of these flags. So now we have our main.js file in our dist folder. So I'm going to move over my index.html and run the static server to check out the result. And we see that we have no user. And then when I click on it, this file looks really strange. But that's OK, because Webpack is going to do all sorts of optimizations that make the final code look unreadable. If you need to debug, you can always set up source maps. So to set up source maps, I'm going to create a configuration file for Webpack named webpack.config.js. This can do some really advanced things like process your TypeScript, copy files, start a dev server, and all sorts of other things. In this video, we're just going to set it up to do some basic bundling. Each Webpack config exports out an object that takes in a couple of required keys. The first one is the entry property. And this is the same thing as our dash dash entry flag. So it's just our source slash index.js. Then the next thing it exports is the output key. And this takes in two keys. The first is the path. And the path is the location of the folder. And to specify this folder, we're actually going to use a Node.js utility that resolves to the folder. And then it takes in the file name, and that is the name of the bundle. And in this case, we'll name it bundle.js. So the first step for the source map is to set the mode to development. And then finally, we'll set a dev tool. And this is how you specify your source maps. 
Now, there are all sorts of types of source map tools you can provide, but we're going to use eval source map because it is really readable. I'm going to provide a link in description for all the other source maps you can use. So now when we build, everything looks great. And we can see that we have our bundle.js in the disk folder. So now in index.html, I'm going to rename the file. And when I run the server, no users on the console. And this is the exact code we wrote in our editor. And I can add breakpoints and step through it as if it was the normal code that we wrote. Drop a comment if you have any questions or an idea for a Fundamentals video. And make sure to check out the Fundamentals playlist because it's brand new, but it's going to be growing with more Fundamental videos over time. But that's the Fundamentals of getting started with Firebase for the web.